fact that he, he planted the seeds of the gospel in A.D. 50. Uh, there were people who got saved. And as they got saved, he brought them together, developed churches. And once he had these churches where he thought they were self-sustaining, he moved on. That's what missionaries do. Uh, but he starts hearing things about the church. And in particular, he gets some letters from the church. And as you've seen in this part of the book of the Bible, we're getting answers to questions they sent him in the letters. And recently, we've been talking about questions they had about marriage. And so basically, what we're discussing is, you know what? Our marriages as Christians should be for the world. The world should see the love of Jesus Christ the way the husband loves the wife. The world should see the submission that the, the body has to Christ and the submission the wife has has to the godly husband. And, and so that's how we are for the world. And that's what we're discussing here. Now today's message really, I think, holds tightly to that title, For Not Of. We as a church are supposed to be for the world. Let's consider the big picture of Corinth. If you've been with us, this is just a review. Corinth was a double seaport. It was an isthmus in Greek in Greece, and they had a seaport kind of to the, to the northwest and one to the southeast, and about five miles between the two, and that's where Corinth laid. And so it was a city of sailors. I was a sailor. I, I was a submariner. I spent my first eight years in the military. I know what it's like to live in a seaport. It's kind of a, a rough town even today. And so you've got two of those. On top of that, you've got a lot of slaves because the materials would cross the isthmus. They'd bring in a ship on one side, they would pack it up, and we discussed that, put them on large carts, maybe even push the entire ship all the way across that portion to the other side. And so you had a lot of slaves, okay, a lot of lower-income people living in Corinth. And then you had the temple prostitutes. Up on the hill was a, a gorgeous temple, beautiful place of worship, and in it was about a thousand priestesses who were prostitutes who would come down and minister in the city. So this was a very dark place. This was a town that you would think, like Sodom and Gomorrah, that God would call down fire from heaven and destroy. And yet, he chose to plant the seeds of the gospel in such a dark place. How should these new believers live? How, what should they do? Should they isolate themselves? Should they pull themselves out of that culture and make their own little cult, their own little group, uh, their own little section of people that were separate? No. As we're going to talk about that today, they were called to, to live where God called them, called to remain as God called them. And so are we. When you look at our culture, the culture in America is becoming more and more Corinthian. When you look at the, the comparisons, they're there. It's a very, very dark time and getting darker. Uh, some of our states, prostitution is legal. The other, it's still practiced. Uh, you look at child pornography is growing. Uh, the number of, of sexual abuses is growing. When you, you look and see what's happening in our own country, it really is sad. And so as Christians, how do we affect that? What, what part do we play in that? Do we just withdraw and isolate ourselves from the world so that we don't get dirty and messy? Or do we remain where God called us so that we can be a light in this dark community? The latter is the truth. I think John MacArthur said it well in his commentary on this passage. He said, Christians should willingly accept the situation into which God has placed them and be content to serve Him there. I agree wholeheartedly. Christianity should be an agent of external social reform. We should be the agents of social, economic, and political change. We should be a light in the darkness. We should be a salt in a flavorless society. Obviously, we don't do it just to make the world a better place. We do it for the ultimate reformation, and that is the salvation of the souls of those around us. What if we withdrew from society? What if we put up our religious barriers what if we decided that we did not want to be of the world as far as being Christians, or before the world, excuse me? Hmm. We're going to talk about that today. How should we live? What should we do with what we have? Where should we be? Who should we be? Let's turn in our text. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It's actually verse 17 where we're going to pick up. Would you stand with us as we read? Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 17 through 40. 
I'm going to finish this, and I, and I, and I don't, I'm not ashamed to say this. I know the last few messages have been tough. Uh, for some of us as, as Christian couples, it's just been amen time. We've just been encouraged. But I know for three weeks, really, we've talked about a lot of hard things when it comes to marriage. And so we're going to be gracious and finish that today and move on. And uh, so we're going to get a bigger chunk of the scripture because, again, I, I've, I feel for those who have to deal with the issues of marriage. All right, so this is a long reading. Just be patient with me. This is the New Living Translation. Each of you Christians should continue to live in whatever situation the Lord has placed you and remain as you were when God first called you. Remember that phrase. This is my rule for all the churches. For instance, a man who was circumcised before he became a believer should not try to reverse it. And a man who was uncircumcised when he became a believer should not be circumcised now. For it makes no difference whether or not a man be circumcised. The important thing is to keep God's commandments. Yes, each of you should remain as you were when God called you. There's a second time. Are you a slave? Don't let that worry you. But if you get a chance to be free, take it. <clears throat> and remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are now free in the Lord. And if you are free when the Lord called you, you're now a slave of Christ. God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved by the world. Each of you, dear brothers and sisters, should remain as you were when God first called you. There's a third time. Now, regarding your question about the young women who are not married, I do not have a command from the Lord for them, but the Lord in His mercy has given me wisdom that can be trusted, and I'll share it with you. Because of the present crisis, I think it is best to remain as you are. There again. If you have a wife, do not seek to end the marriage. If you do not have a wife, do not seek to get married. But if you do get married, it's not a sin. And if a young woman gets married, it's not a sin. However, those who get married at this time will have troubles, and I am trying to spare you those problems. But let me say this, dear brothers and sisters. The time that remains is very short. So from now on, those with wives should not focus only on their marriage. Those who weep or who rejoice or who buy things should not be absorbed by their weeping or their joy of their possessions. Those who use the things of the world should not become attached to them. For this world as we know it will soon pass away. I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I'm saying this for your benefit, not, not to place a restriction on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. But if a man thinks that he's treating his fiancée improperly and will inevitably give in to his passion, let him marry her as he wishes. It's not a sin. But if he has decided firmly not to marry and there is no urgency and can, can control his passion, he does well not to marry. So the person who marries his fiancée does well. The person who doesn't marry does even better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. If her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but only if he loves the Lord. But in my opinion, it would be better for her to stay single. And I think I'm giving you counsel from the God's Spirit when I say this. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the wisdom and experience of the author of this letter. The Apostle Paul, called by Jesus himself to be that apostle, was given this great opportunity uh, to live a life in a dark world that is an example for us to follow. So I pray that Father will take his words this morning and, and we'll transfer them to today, to 2019, and see just how applicable they are. I thank you for the, the marriages that are represented in this room, for the, the many years of God, the example that we have. And Father, I pray for those who have been broken from marriage and those who are seeking marriage for the first time. These are all very important decisions to make and situations to be in. And now we're going to open the umbrella and see a lot more this morning. And so I just pray that you'll encourage our hearts today from your word that we 
we'll have the confidence to remain as we were when you called us. For those who are unsaved, if you're calling them today, I pray that they will answer the conviction of the Holy Spirit on their heart this morning and receive Christ as their Savior before it's ever too late. Now bless the reading of your word. Remove me from it and speak through it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We've spent almost a month now answering questions. The first question, it appears, and we don't have those letters that were written to Paul, so we can formulate those questions. It appears the first question was, should we remain celibate? Now that we're saved, and we're saved from sin, and sexual sin was a big part of our life, should we remain celibate in order not to sin again? And the answer, as Pastor Andrew shared, was our favorite answer. Yes and no, right? Yes and no. Yes, if you are single, you should remain celibate. Marriage is the union in which God established for the sexual needs to be met, that he gave us a creation. And so we know, yes, you should be celibate if you're single. Uh, if you're married, the answer still is yes and no. There may be a window of opportunity, maybe you know, a few days, maybe a week, where you're focusing on your relationship with God, you're, you're wanting to get more intimate with God, and so on purpose you are refraining from intimacy with your spouse. Uh, as long as they know why you're doing what you're doing, that's fine. That is a time to be celibate. But as he warns, come back together quickly because that gives a foothold to the devil. In other words, if you continue to practice celibacy in your marriage, divorce will happen because of adultery. It's a big possibility. And so yes and no. Yes, there is a time to be celibate, but no, that is not the rule in marriage. He answered that question. The next week, we stepped into another arena. If I was married before I was saved, and that marriage was broken by either divorce or death, am, am I cursed, I guess, for the rest of my life to be single and be celibate because of that? And the answer kind of was yes and no again. Yes. If you're unmarried, if you had been married previously and that marriage was broken by death or divorce, you have to remain celibate. You remain celibate, you are married to Jesus, and you're serving him with all your heart as we heard again today. And he'll give you the gift, either the gift of grace, the gift that you can remain celibate the rest of your life, or he'll give you the gift of a Christian partner. Remember, they have to be Christian. So yes and no, right? You remain celibate if you've been married before and we're not married then. Finally, we discussed last week, okay, I was unsaved when I got married, and he was unsaved, and, and I get saved now after marriage. Should I, should I divorce him because he's not a Christian and go marry another Christian so we can have a Christian marriage? No. We answered that clearly. Right? Obviously, the, the bold statement is, if both of you are Christians, stay married. If both of you are Christians, stay married. If both of you are Christians, what? Join me. Stay married. Okay, that's the command from the Lord. That's not Paul's wisdom. That's not Paul's advice. That's not Paul's suggestion. If two Christians are married, as you heard again today, we stay married until one dies or both. That is Christian marriage, period. All right. If we separate, it's only for a short period of time to come back together and reconcile. So that was the simple answer. But the next answer got a little tricky. Yes, if you're married to an unbeliever, you stay. If they're willing to live with you in peace, then you stay because you bring sanctity, you bring holiness to that home. Remember we talked about it. Is it better to have one believer in a house or none? Right? One is better than none. You sanctify the home, and so you stay as long as the unbeliever is willing to live at peace. And if they're not, and if they leave, or as we talked, if it's abusive, they leave the relationship, Obviously, it's as if it never happened. The bond is broken. You're unmarried, but you can be married again. We answered those questions. Now today, we get to some more questions. And, and Paul throws a couple of new scenarios in to help us flesh out the motives. So let's see how he ends this up. Our, our subtitle here, you keep seeing it, Remain as you were when God called you. Remain as you were when God called you. He said it three times. Anytime you see something that is repeated in the scriptures, it should throw a flag. This must be important. Now, don't start sweating if it's 10 till and I'm only through the first two points because that's where my efforts are going to be today. 
As I mentioned a minute ago, we have talked a lot about marriage, so I will keep that to a minimum. Um, most people think erroneously that when we get right with God, everything in our life should change, right? God's going to change everything. Well, a lot should change, obviously, on the inside. Salvation brings an inner change, right? When we repent of our sins, we, we change our mind about sin. We change our mind about God. We change our mind about who we're supposed to be. And those changes do lead to a change of behavior. But they don't necessarily lead to changes in the external things like where we live and what we do for a living. Life after salvation often continues as it was for a reason. Now, we have to understand, God has strategically placed us where we are. Wherever you are, even, even if it was before you were unsaved, God strategically placed you where you are. If you're a teacher, you're strategically placed there. If you got a job down at the, the Toyota plant, God has strategically placed you there. Wherever you are and whatever you do, God has put you there on purpose. And he wants you to be there on purpose. As Paul begins to pull this out of the conversation, God placed you, for example, in your culture for a reason. God placed us in our race for a reason. God placed us in our nationality for a reason. God, God placed us in our social, and this is tough, our social or economic class for a reason. And all these things help to make up who we are. So when we get saved, we have to be careful not to lose our identity. I want to talk about that. We have to be careful not to lose our identity. Let me start by making a correlation to the text. We talked about this Wednesday night in Bible study, if you were with us. Paul speaks of circumcision. Circumcision was given, as we discussed in the book of Genesis, uh, to Abraham when he was 99 years old, and his son, Ishmael, was 13 years old. He was commanded by God to circumcise himself, his son, and all the men in his family. And from that day on, on the eighth day, every Jewish boy would be circumcised, all right? That's it. It was a mark to show that there were God's chosen people. Did it save them? Absolutely not. If it did, only the men were saved because the women weren't circumcised. So it did not save anyone. It was simply a mark that they were a Jew. Now, in this time of, of history, that wasn't necessarily a popular thing. In the Greek culture of, of Corinth and the surrounding areas, uh, Judaism was not looked up to. It was actually looked down upon. And as a result, a lot of the Jews, the men, tried to look Hellenistic. They tried to be like the Greeks. And because of that, I did some studying this week. I had read past this passage many times as figurative, but it's literal. They had a, a, a reverse circumcision procedure. It's historic. Josephus records it. He's a non-biblical historian from the first century. He records the fact that the men wanted to look like the Hellenistic Jews. And so in the bathhouses, in the, in the gymnasiums, the places where they would change clothes, it would be obvious that they were Jewish men. And so they actually developed a process to undo circumcision. That's what he's referring to in this passage. I kind of like, I never knew that. Learned a little bit of something this week. And so he is saying very clearly, you do not need to change that. If you were uncircumcised when you got saved, you don't have to get circumcised. If you were circumcised, you don't have to reverse it. In other words, you don't need to change your identity. You are who you are because that's what circumcision did. It identified them as Jews. We stop and think about it. Once we're saved, our nationality is important. Once we're saved, our race is important. Where we come from is important. Our social status is important. Stop and think, who would be the best to reach a Jew for the gospel? A Jewish person who accepted Christ as the Messiah. So our nationality, our race, our culture, our economic and social status, they are who we are and we're not supposed to leave those behind. We're to remain as we were when God called us. Let me give you an example to make sense of this. Some foreign missionaries commit a tragic failure when they go to the field. They go to a foreign country, 
They go to people who speak a different language, who are different colored skin, who are different, again, completely different from them. And they go there with good intentions. But instead of converting them to Christ, they convert them to American Christianity. Right? They teach them how to sing our hymns like we sing. They teach them to dress like we dress. They teach them to do church like we do church. They teach them enough English so they can put a King James Bible in their hand. I'm, I'm, that's a pun, by the way. Uh, so that they can read the right text. Right? They convert them to American Christianity instead of to an indigenous faith. They lose their culture. They lose their nationality. They, they lose their identity. And they're surprised when they can't reach their own people. And why the churches fail when the missionary leaves. Right? Stop and think about it. We do not change the externals once we're saved. Our, our identity is very, very important because it helps us to be the people that we're supposed to be. Paul tells us what really is important. It's not necessarily identity. He says in verse 19, the important thing is to keep God's commandments. Right? That's the important thing is to keep God's commandments. Um, I thought about this and when I read this part I was reminded of the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus steps out of the boat uh, into the Decapolis, and immediately the, the man possessed by the legion of demons. You know the story. The guy comes. They can't chain him. He's naked. He's cutting himself. He's, he's, he's just a nasty man, and he falls at Jesus' feet. And long story short, Jesus casts the demons out into the swine. They go over the cliff, and they die. And, and the man is sitting there with his senses, and he's dressed and, and all the people see him and they, they tell Jesus to leave. They, they don't want Jesus. And so Jesus is getting back in the boat with his Jewish counterparts. And this Gentile man says, no, 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 no. Can I go with you? I, I want to be like you. I, I want to be like these guys in the boat. I want to go back to Israel with you guys. I, I want to convert. Okay? I want to follow you all. And what did Jesus say? He said, no. You stay here. You stay in your culture. You stay with your people. You stay with your family and do what? Tell them what God has done for you. And he did. He went out to the ten towns of the Decapolis and he shared what Jesus had done for him. And we have archaeological findings of each of those cities of churches that were planted. Because this one man stayed in his culture. He stayed in his identity. And he simply told what God had done for him. He remained as God had called him. And we have to remain as God has called us. Our identity matters. Second one, remain as you were when you were called. Excuse me. In verse 20, Paul says it again. This time he gives a new context. Employment. I like talking about employment, by the way. This is one of my favorites. Just because you're right with God, don't quit your job. All right? Jesus saved you from your sins, not from your crappy job. Okay? Let's talk about this. This is really important, okay? Really important. Surely when someone gets saved, Jesus is going to take them out of that stinking hole where they work, right? Surely a Christian doesn't have to wait tables. Surely a Christian shouldn't have to clean toilets with a toothbrush. <laughs> I've done that. Surely a Christian shouldn't have to do a thankless job for a little pay. Surely our employment will change for the better. When we're saved. Anybody like that theology? Yeah, I doubt it. Once again, we've got to bring into the context what Paul said in that first century. Um, we had this conversation not too long ago, so I won't dwell on it too deeply. Simply put, slavery was first century employment. It wasn't like what we've seen in the history of America. It wasn't forced. People weren't sold. Uh, slavery was kind of organized labor in the first century. You had business owners and they would purchase for the sake of anything else someone who wanted to be their employee. And they would come and they would have a contract and they would work a finite number of years. And when that contract was up, they would have the option to, to go, to be freed, or to stay. And most of them chose to stay because it was their employment. They built relationships with their employer. And so when we talk slavery, we are comparing apples to apples when we talk about the average person employed today. Uh, and so we got to think this does apply to us very clearly. That's the context Paul's writing it in. What's he saying? 
He's saying don't quit your old job just because you got saved. Now, there are scenarios where, where this should be broken. If your old job is prostitution, you quit prostituting. If your old job is thieving, you quit thieving. If your old job requires you to do something sinful and you get saved, then yes, you need to break that bond. But otherwise, you remain where you are. Why? Stop and think. How many hours do you spend at work? You spend at least a third, unless you're retired, unless a third of your waking hours are spent with employment. Many mo is more than that. And so where is your greatest field of influence? Where are the greatest number of people who know you, who you can reach with the gospel? Where is the best place to be once Christ has come into your life? It's the workplace, okay? So, you've got to be careful. Now, don't ask the unnecessary question. Paul says if you get a better opportunity, you should take it. That's not sin. Yes, God may bless you with a better work situation. If he does, take it. But if he doesn't, we shouldn't gripe and complain about our horrible job. Remember, Paul said this in the 22nd verse of that chapter. You are now a slave of Christ. Wherever you work, whoever you work for, they're not your boss anymore. You are now a slave of Christ. You are free to serve your master. Colossians chapter 3, Paul makes this clear. He says that once we are saved, we are to work willingly with all of our heart at whatever we do for a living. All right? We work as if we're working for the Lord because guess what? We are. <laughs> we are working for the Lord. So we are to remain in the position that God put us in unless he moves us. Thirdly, you should recognize this statement by now. Remain as you were when God called you. All right? Remain as you were when God called you. The phrase comes up in verse 24 and right after it he begins to reiterate a little bit about what we've talked about the last few weeks. First, stay single. If you've never been married, he says, I recommend you stay single. Notice what he did say, though. I don't have a command for the Lord on this. He says, but the Lord has given me wisdom that can be trusted. And so he's sharing that wisdom. In the next sentence, he establishes his reason for staying single. He speaks of a present crisis. Okay, this is something that was happened, most scholars and theologians believe, in that first century. And it's pointing towards uh, the way that the, children, or the Christians were going to be persecuted. Right? The Romans did not think highly of Christianity. And, and the further along it got, the more the persecution got. And so he is saying it's better you remain single in this time of trial. Because think about it, if you get married, right, you start a family, your family is going to be persecuted. You may have to watch your wife. Uh, get murdered. You may have to watch your children get sewn up into animal skins and fed to lions in a coliseum. Or they may have to watch you get burned at the stake. That's what was coming. That, that was that near future for these people in Corinth. And he says, look, it would be better if you stayed single during these troubled times because that's what he said. Those who get married at this time will have troubles. And I'm trying to spare you those problems. So it's not a command. It's simply wisdom for the day. But even in those hard times, Paul was gracious. He says, it's not a sin to marry. It's just best if you stay single, given what's going on. Okay? So the second thing he says is stay married. And we've talked about that. If two Christians are married, they should what? Stay married. For how long? Forever. All right? Forever. Two Christians should stay married forever. That's very clear. We don't have to talk about that in great detail. Um, the last thing we see is stay unmarried, okay? Stay unmarried. Again, verse 32, he uses that Greek term, which means the negative of married, which means they were married, they were divorced, or they were widowed. And he says, if that's the case, then you should remain that way. Again, he's saying with these difficult times, it's best that you simply focus upon the Lord and be the light in your community. He's honest with his presentation. He doesn't say it's a sin to remarry, but if you remarry, who does he say you have to marry? Someone who loves the Lord. Someone who loves the Lord. So Mr. or Mrs. Wright will always be right with God. Period. Okay, finally, he gives his, his, here's his motive. Here's why he's gone to all this great detail in answering these questions. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord the best with as few distractions as possible. Okay, that's the big idea. If you're saved, don't try to change your identity. 
You are who you are for a reason. You come from where you come from for a reason. If there are changes that need to be made, God will make them. You are called to serve the Lord where you are. Don't let your identity be a distraction. If you're saved, don't gripe about your job. You're in a position for a reason. If God rewards you with a better opportunity, take it. But until that reward comes, work there as if you're working for the Lord. Don't let that misery be a distraction. You were bought with a high price, right? That's why you are now a slave of Jesus Christ. Don't let your job be a distraction. If you're married, stay married, okay? Even if you're married to an unbeliever. Don't let marriage become a distraction. If you're not married, okay, whether it's by divorce, death, or never been married before, don't let singleness become a distraction. Don't let loneliness become a distraction. Be married to the Lord. And if he blesses you with the opportunity to marry, then marry the Christian. So, the world's dark, dark place. We could say the same thing about our country. Where does the light shine brightest? In the darkness. Jesus said very clearly in Matthew, again I was drawn to this Matthew five fifteen. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. So if we are saved, if we're followers of Jesus Christ, we are to remain where we were when he called us and shine in that darkness so that we make a difference in this world. So the invitation is kind of broad. Let's consider the conditions. Do you struggle with where you come from? Do you struggle with the family background, with the cultural background, with the socioeconomical background? Um, remember, those are the building blocks that God has given you. And you are specifically and uniquely made to reach a certain group of people with the truth. So race, nationality, and culture, these define who we are. They don't change at salvation. They equip us to reach the lost world. Are you struggling with a job situation? Are you miserable? I've been there. Is it the pay? Is it the people? Is it the work? Satan wants to use these things as a distraction. He doesn't want you to be the light in that community. Don't let that happen. You are where you are for a reason. What is your marriage situation? Boy, I, this, one's, this one's really close. Just within the last 24 hours. What is your situation in marriage? If you're a husband and wife, what are you doing to ensure that you continue to show the light in the dark world as you remain together until one or both of you are called away? What are you doing to ensure that you remain as you were when God called you? What about those who haven't been married yet? Right? What about those of you looking for Mr. or Mrs. Wright? Remain as you are when God called you. Be patient. Don't get in a hurry. God will provide that person. Same if you're unmarried because you've been divorced or widowed. Be married to Jesus Christ until he brings that person in your life. Finally, maybe you realize you weren't part of the audience. This is written to Christians. These are instructions for the way we should live. This is wisdom for us to be a light in a dark world, salt in a flavorless world. But maybe that's not you. You're here for a reason. I, I don't know why you came, but I know why God brought you. He brought you to share the truth that we've been talking of, the fact that he will save you wherever you are, whatever you've done, whoever you've been with. Wow. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I encourage you today, if you've never been saved, we'd love to talk to you. We'd love to explain what it means to be saved. We'd love to pray with you as you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can come during our last song. Dale's going to sing a song that he wrote. It's called Salt of the Earth. As Christians, that's our invitation. We need to be praying that we're the salt of the earth. And if you're unsaved, today would be the day to take that first step. Father God in heaven, thank you for your word. It's truth. Guide us in your truth. You've called us where we are. You've placed us where we are. We're here on purpose. And God, forgive us for getting distracted because that's what the enemy wants. He wants the darkness to continue to grow. But Father, we should be a light. We should be salt. Forgive us for not being that. Thank you for the positions you've placed us in. Thank you for the opportunities you put around us. And now bring to, to mind those faces, those names of all those people we have in contact with us who need to know Jesus Christ. 
may our witness draw them to your grace. For those who aren't saved, maybe they've seen that person at work. Maybe they've seen that person in their family. Those people who are, who are trying their best to be a witness in a dark place. And maybe that's attracted them and maybe that's why they're here. Father, if, if they're here for that reason, trying to figure out what it means to be saved, Father, just work in their heart in a way that they'll come forward and say, I don't know what else to do, but that's what I want. Give them strength to step out and act upon their conviction. God, we love you. Bless your invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. This is your time to come.
So remain where you are. That's an important statement to get today. Your situation was sovereign and is sovereign. God has placed you there for a reason. Look around and see what it is. If we can help in any way, we'd love to. Andrew will stick around down front. I'll catch you at the door. We've got this time in between the services. If you're not already in class, we'd love to talk to you. Uh, but thanks for coming. We look forward to seeing you again uh, Wednesday night for your Bible study. Don't forget that. It is business meeting night, and you're all welcome to it. It's good business, and it's very important for us to be stewards of what God has given us. And so please don't skip just because it's business meeting. We'll still have our prayer time. We'll still have our worship time. Uh, again, you're invited. You're also invited tonight, 7.30, all right? Yep. 7 yep. o'clock. Yep. Let me get it right. Uh, our worship team, part of our worship team, Dale and the, and the Highlanders are uh, the main band tonight, right? Yep. The headliner over to Putnam County Fair. And so let's, let's show up. Let's be uh, supportive and encouraging. And uh, had the chance of being there last night. We got invited, uh, myself and a couple of the soldiers, sailors. And we had soldiers, sailors, and airmen. And we, they asked us to come and to open up the fair with prayer. I, you, you, I never turn that down. Even though it was 90 degrees. And you know where they do the tractor pulls? That's where we were. In that dirt in our dress uniforms. I'd never say no to that. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm thankful for the community that we live in. It is a dark world. But again, when leadership in our county asks for prayer to, to begin our fair, that, that speaks and we're going to do that, and we did. So praise the Lord for that. All right, again, Andrew, be down front. I'll be at the back. We'd love to talk to you. Thanks for coming. We'll see you Wednesday or next Sunday morning. Uh, where will we be in the Bible next Sunday morning? First Corinthians chapter 8. Be good Bereans. Open up the text. Go ahead and read ahead. Be ready to go. You'll get more out of the sermon if you do that. Love you dearly. God loves you even more. Dale, would you close us in prayer?